God, we are so thankful. We are thankful so much, Father, for this incredible opportunity we have to be in this space to celebrate the greatest mystery, the greatest event that ever happened in human race, the resurrection of Jesus. So God, as we dive into your word, would you speak to us? Anoint this lips of clear God that the words I speak are going to be simple, that they may be powerful enough to bring a transformation, to impact us, to bring wisdom, knowledge, and direction. Speak through me and anoint our hearts and our ears that we would truly hear you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the past six weeks, so today's the seventh week, we've been going through a series on the I Am series of Christ, the seven I Ams that Jesus spoke. And, and my goal in uh, doing this series was to be able to just uh, remind us that Jesus is not just one of the gods that exists on, on earth. He's not just, Christianity is not just another relationship, that Jesus was actually God. At times, uh, as Christians, it's, we believe what we believe, but defending our faith is so hard. And Apostle Paul talks about being able to defend the faith you believe. And my hope just during this season, series was for us to be able to get to a place where we can defend what we believe. We can be able to like say, yes, I believe that Jesus is Lord, but this is A, B, C, D. Why? I know, and I know without a shadow of doubt that he is God, he is Lord, and that's why I chose him. I'm not a Christian just because my mama was a Christian and I was, I was going to church from a, from a child. I am a Christian because I believe for certainty that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the Son of God. And so we looked through, we saw that Jesus was the bread of life. Uh, in the temple, you always had bread in the, in, the, in the Holy of Holies, and that bread, which was a symbol of God's presence that the children of Israel ate, was a representation of who Jesus was. So we can't really get life. We can't get wholeness. Our souls cannot be nourished without this bread of life feeding us. We also saw that Jesus was, is the light of the world. The world is in darkness if Jesus doesn't show up. And we saw um, I, I, um, on Friday during uh, Good Friday that when Jesus went to the cross and he died, when he was still on the cross before he died, actually darkness filled the earth because sin had come upon the light. And so when the light now carries sin, it impacts the whole of creation. Even the sun stood still, the sun stopped shining, and darkness was upon the face of the earth. At noon, every place became dark because the one who is the light now was carrying sin, and so everything else became dark. And we also saw that Jesus is the door. He's the access to God. Nobody, there's no other way to the Father. There's no other access. And no, because Jesus is the access to the Father, he's the door, it means I can't deny anybody from entering heaven. Only Jesus gives access, and so anybody has access to God. We saw that Jesus was a good shepherd. It's not like a shepherd, like some of the shepherds um, are in the Jewish context, or maybe even some of us like shepherds. He's a shepherd who loves, who cares, who protects, and who watches over his own. And we also saw that Jesus was the way, the truth. There is no other way to God except through Jesus. And last week, Eric did a good job showing us that Jesus was the vine. And so this morning, we are looking at Jesus as the resurrection and the life. And I think it's just appropriate that today we look at Jesus as the resurrection and the life because this is Resurrection Sunday. And the text we read, I know some of you are like, why did we read that text? It's not resurrection text. We are going to read resurrection text later. But this is a text where Jesus declares himself, declares to the people that he's the resurrection and the life. And so Lazarus is Jesus' friend. And Lazarus has, if somebody is your friend, it means they have surely spent time with you. So he has, he has spent time with Jesus and Lazarus falls sick. And Jesus receives the news of Lazarus' sickness. Instead of Jesus going back to heal because Jesus was a miracle worker. They had seen him heal the sick, raise the dead, do outstanding miracles already. Blind eyes had been popped open by Jesus. Deaf ears were unstopped. So Jesus had done miracles. And so when when they are sending news to tell Jesus that Jesus, your friend Lazarus is sick, they know that Jesus will respond. They know that Jesus is going to surely come because this is his friend. And there are times in our walk with God where we call and we expect him to show up at a certain time and it looks like he's delaying. Anybody ever been there? Where you call and you expected that God was going to show up like, and you know, and somehow Jesus takes his time. 
And I think he does that to us so many times, and, and I hate it when he does that. <laughs> and so Jesus allows Lazarus to die. And then he tells the disciples, let us go see Lazarus, he's sleeping. And Thomas was like, well, if he's sleeping, and so, then he said, no, he's not sleeping, he's dead. Then Thomas finally like, okay, let's just go and die with him. <laughs> this one that Jesus says, you, you, it was your best friend, and now you are saying that he's dead. You didn't show up, so let's just better go and die. This following that we are following like that, there might be nothing coming out of it. So they come, and they go to see Jesus, and Jesus meets Martha. And Martha is like, oh, Jesus, if you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. If you were here, this circumstance would have changed. If you were here, this thing wouldn't have happened. That is probably me a lot of the times. God, if you just showed up when I called you, it wouldn't have been bad like this. The good thing is that God is never late. He's always on time. It might not be our time, but God's time is always the right time. And so Jesus shows up and Martha is giving this explanation, and then Mary comes. But the amazing thing is, after they are doing all this dialogue back and forth, and they are like, if I know if you were here, my brother would have um, not died, and all of that. Jesus says, well, I'm the resurrection of the life. And Martha is like, well, I know, he, I, know he, I, I don't doubt that he will rise on the last day. I know it. He will rise on the last day. And Jesus is trying to let her know that that is not the kind of resurrection I'm talking about. I have the ability to raise somebody who is even buried. Because it's easy when Jesus raises maybe a child who is just dead and they have just died. It's easy to say they were just in a coma. They had really not died. But now Lazarus is dead. Lazarus has been buried and he's been four days in the grave. According to the Jewish culture, they didn't have all the embalming things that we have. They had some spices. The spices was just to keep the body from the stench quickly. And so Lazarus is already starting to smell. He's already starting to stink. And Jesus says, roll the stone. Put yourself in that space. <laughs> Imagine that you are in that place and Jesus is saying, roll the stone. And I wonder if there's something in your life that you feel like, God, this is smelling. This is Forgotten, I've actually forgotten about this issue, God, so I don't even want to talk about it because it's dead and it's done. I want you to know that Jesus is able to bring even the, the deadest of things, I don't know if that's English, back to life. That there is nothing that Jesus cannot resurrect. And Jesus go, rolls the stone, they roll the stone and Jesus called Lazarus. Oh, he says, Lazarus, come for. And then... Lazarus comes back to life. But what is amazing about this text is that this text is not just about Lazarus. It's about Jesus showing us a picture of the fact that he was going to go to the grave. And one day he was going to rise again. That even death could not hold him captive. That the same way Lazarus was able to come back to life, that him, Jesus, was going to resurrect. So in the book of Matthew, we have this story in all the Gospels. But in the book of Matthew... The women go to the grave to visit Jesus, taking their spices to anoint his body, just like with Lazarus, so that he doesn't smell quickly, just so that at least he stays there a little longer, smells good a little longer. That's how much they love Jesus. They just wanted to make sure that his, his, the smell is still good around his body. But yes, hear what happens in Matthew chapter 28. The Bible says, after the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and it became an and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you, so the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. 
Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came, they came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers, go to Galilee, there they will see me. Go tell my brothers to go to Galilee, there they will see me. So Jesus, Mary and the women go to the tomb to, embalm, to anoint Jesus' body. And when they get there, they see something strange. First of all, there is an earthquake, and they're like, why is there going to be an earthquake? Why do we have tornado in winter? <laughs> we can't have, do we have tornado? Is it winter? In the spring, that's why we have tornadoes. So why should we have tornadoes in the winter? I think I'm, I know some of you are just looking at me like, what did she say? <laughs> but it's like something is happening in the wrong time. There is an earthquake, and the stone is rolled away. And now the first thing they see is this angel and they are in awe and the angel is telling them, this Jesus is resurrected. And as they leave on their way to go see, to go tell the brothers as the angel has instructed them, they actually see Jesus. And Jesus tells them, go tell my brother. And this morning what I wanted to do is to be able to give us a few proofs of the fact that Jesus is truly resurrected. In, in the... In the in the, in, the, in the olden days, there were several concepts of, of what the resurrection was. When people talked to re resurrection, there were several things that they actually meant. So the Judeans, they actually affirmed the resurrection. But the, their resurrection was a resurrection of the last day. When everything is said and done, then everybody will be resurrected. Nobody ever believed that anybody who is dead and goes, is buried for days will come back to life by themselves. It's just like... When John, when, 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 when uh, Mary's husband, Joseph, when God encounters him and like say, hey, that thing that your woman, your wife is carrying is a child of the Holy Ghost. The reason why Joseph is a little confused is because he knows how women give birth. He knows how women conceive. And so when Jesus, when they are talking about resurrection, everybody knows in that context that people don't just get up from the dead. For some of you who have lost maybe loved ones now, if you go back to your house and you see them sitting on the couch, you are going to run. <laughs> the reason why you run is because you know pe dead people don't just come back to life. We know there will be a resurrection, but we know it's going to be on the last day. We all know that. That when all of this is said and done, I'm going to see my dad, you're going to see your uncle, you're going to see your spouse, we're going to meet. And we know that when all of this is said and done, we are going to be all resurrected. But this is happening in the middle of the, it's like in the in-between of the seasons of the time. And so the Judeans didn't believe, they believed in resurrection, but it was a resurrection that was going to happen at the end of everything. Then the Gentiles also believed in the resurrection. They believed that the soul was immortal. So when they talked about resurrection, they was like, okay, it was a soul. So when they say somebody is resurrected, it's like, it's just their spirit. So it's never really like a bodily resurrection. And so what is happening with the disciples is Jesus resurrects bodily. So, and that's the distinction of Christianity. It's the bodily, it's not just the resurrection of Jesus, it's the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Jesus had flesh and blood. The only difference with the body of Jesus is that the body could go through walls. The body could enter closed doors. There was no space the body couldn't enter. The sign another significant thing is that the body of Jesus was in such a way that they could tell that it was Jesus, but they were still not sure that it was Jesus. It was like, it was like Jesus, but it was different. And Apostle Paul calls it the glorified body. It was a different kind of, that's why people, when people have had like a near-death experience, they'll say, oh, I saw my auntie, they looked like they were 15. Maybe they didn't see them when they were 15. But they, they, there is something about the body that is different. But it's still the same person, you can recognize them. And so Jesus rises from the dead, and he has all of these appearances. So let's look at some of the different appearances that prove the resurrection. And I would have loved to go to, oh, let's, let, let me start a little, I'll come to the appearances. Let me do a little, a little history. Most often in history, if you want to prove that something, uh, like, that something is truthful historically, it has to be have something that has happened in the first 100 years. At least there is um, uh, eyewitnesses of that event. There is a uh, testimony of people who had been there. But it is only in Christianity 
whether it is Buddhist, whether it is of all the other religions, are stories that are told hundreds of years after whoever their prophet or their leader was had died. But in Christianity, the first thing is, the Gospels, the first three Gospels were written in the early 30s up to 50. The book of John was written like 70 AD. So the book of John is actually the oldest of the Gospels. But all the others were written and those who read it, eyewitnesses of Jesus' death and resurrection were still alive. Actually, when Paul is writing to the Corinthians, he tells them, go and ask those who were there from the beginning. So there are eyewitnesses of these events that the believers are talking about. It's not just a story. There is eyewitnesses of the events that happened. And it's not only the Bible that says it. If you read um, several hist historical books, even atheists believe that there were authentic stories of people who had seen Jesus resurrected. And so, what are some few scriptures that show us and prove to us that Jesus truly resurrected bodily? The first one is the story of the women. In the Jewish culture, the, the testimony of a woman doesn't have weight. If you actually look at Paul's testimony in the book of Corinthians, Paul doesn't mention the women. Because towards the early um, uh, um, uh, century, after they have the, first, the, the first 30 years had gone, they started wanting to, it's like we want to like, do something to like, really show to show this testimony that there were other men who saw it and not just the women. So Paul doesn't really talk about the presence of the women, but the women were the first. And so if the apostles could tell the story and put women as of initial witnesses, it must have been really true. For a culture that did not believe or value the testimony of a woman. The second thing is, the other disciples, who it wasn't just the women who saw Jesus, the other disciples who came, Peter and the other one I was reading yesterday and I was laughing because Peter said him and the other disciples were running, but the other disciples ran past Peter. I don't know if that he was because he was older or he just couldn't run as fast as like me. Uh, the other disciples ran past him, got to the temple, but there were other disciples who saw Jesus. The 12 saw Jesus several times. They actually had a meal together. So there were other disciples who saw Jesus. The next thing, Thomas. Anybody knows Thomas? Thomas saw Jesus. He didn't just see Jesus. He put his hand through the hole. And he was like, oh, yeah, okay. It's truly him, yes. Because Thomas still doubted. I would doubt. Like, how would somebody come out from the dead like that? But then the disciples on the road to Emmaus, when they were going to Emmaus, they had an encounter with Jesus. And they're like, oh, wow, it was him that we saw. They talked with him, ate with him. So it wasn't just a ghost, because you don't eat with ghosts. Ghosts don't eat our kind of food. They talked with him, ate with him, and feasted with him. And then when Jesus opened their eyes, they're like, oh, yeah, it was Jesus. And they went back to worship him. So the disciples on Emmaus. And Paul writes, in Paul, in the book of Corinthians 15, Paul says they were like, about one time when like 500 people saw Jesus at one time. Because there are several um, uh, people who try to counter the resurrection, saying that it wasn't real. That the disciples were having like hypnotism. I don't know how do they call that. It's a word. Like hallucination. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Hey, you have some smart people here. <laughs> so that they, were being, they were hallucinating. They were really not seeing Jesus. They were hallucinating. But 500 people cannot ha hallucinate at the same time. For 500 people to hallucinate at the same time, I don't know what you're going to use. But 500 people saw Jesus at the same time. So there is enough proof and enough evidence that Jesus truly resurrected bodily. He came out of that grave and then rose again. But what does that mean to us as believers? Because I think for me, that is the key. That is important. That is significant. What does that mean? If Jesus truly died and Jesus truly resurrected from the dead, it means the price for our sin is fully paid. It means the blood of Jesus Christ was enough to purchase our redemption. It means I don't have to work again to become a child of God. It means my salvation is not based by my works. It means somebody else paid the price. Jesus' resurrection was God saying price paid, accepted, deal sealed. It was enough. If the blood of Jesus wasn't enough, Jesus wouldn't have been able to come out of that grave. But because the price for our redemption was enough, then the grave couldn't hold 
Jesus again captive. Even the devil knew the price has been paid, so I have no hold again. And that's why the Bible tells us, oh, dead, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Because the price is fully paid. All we have to do is believe. It's that amazing and simple. It's that incredible good news. That the king of glory would come and die for a woman. Ordinary, messed up, broken like me. That is good news. That a price has been paid. I don't have to walk again for my redemption. I don't have to be extra good again for God to accept me. The only reason why I live the way I live is because the price has been paid and I believe that. And so now I live to honor him. I don't live right to buy my salvation. I live right because I have been saved and now I'm living to give God glory. The price has been paid. That is incredible. But another implication for our salvation is not only that the price has been paid. Is that now we all have access to God the Father. If you remember on the on Good Friday when the when the Jesus died and the veil was torn open in the temple, that was a space that nobody could enter except a high priest. Only one person could go in the Holy of Holies. Only one. But now God is saying, You have access to me. I am your daddy. You can come when you're in the bathroom. You can come to me when you're in the shower. You can come to me when you are driving. You have full access, no more restrictions. Everything that stood as a barrier has been removed. You can come young, you can come old. You can come when you have messed up, you can come when you're living holy. But it says full access has been granted. And we all can come boldly to this throne of grace and find help and obtain mercy in time of need. We all, no exemptions. Isn't that amazing? Most places where you want to go, if I want to go see the president now, the protocol is going to be incredible. It's going to be from one protocol and next protocol and next protocol. But God says, access to you is granted. You don't need any protocol. You don't need anything else. Access to God has been granted. No restrictions. Every barrier removed. The next implication of the salvation is that this gospel is now to the entire world. It is supposed to go to the entire world. There's no longer Gentile or Jew, no longer white or black. And now we all are sons and daughters of God, just by the blood of Jesus. That's amazing. And a few things that I didn't talk about in, in, in there, and I think that are so important in, in, in the proof of our salvation. Let me just finish. No, th- th- thank you so much. Can you just, let's just go to the implication and I'll go back to those proofs. The next thing is that we do no longer have to walk in bondage. We do no longer have to walk in sin. We do no longer have to walk enslaved. We do no longer have to walk in condemnation. We do no longer have to believe the lies of the devil. And at times it's so sad and even though we know know that Jesus is resurrected, many of us as believers walk in this sense of condemnation. Every time we condemn ourselves, I'm not good, I'm not, I'm not qualified. Or maybe I did something wrong and I feel like, oh, maybe because of what I did, I'm no longer a child of God. No. Apostle Paul says, now there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Yes, I know your past was messed up. Yes, I know. Yes. Do you think Jesus doesn't know? He knows. But somebody has paid the price so that you can walk in freedom. You don't have to walk in guilt, in shame anymore. You can walk with your head up. You can walk with your shoulders lifted, not in pride, but because the price is paid. Somebody say, oh, no, I knew you 20 years ago, Velma. You was, remember your high school life? You used to drink and get drunk. Oh, yeah, that Velma, she died. This one, it's a new creature in Christ Jesus. 
She's been redeemed. She's been set free. There's therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. And even today, if it happened that I stumble, I can pick myself up, clean myself, and keep going and not allow my mistakes and my failures to hold me down. Jesus died, resurrected for your freedom, for my freedom. The next thing, implication about the resurrection is that now we have become resurrection people. Is that now God's kingdom now lives on earth. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Is that now you don't just walk as a child of God? Is that you walk as a carrier and as a temple of God? So when you go to your office, God entered your office with you. When you're in your home, God is in your home with you. When you're chatting with your friends, God is right there with you. If we would truly believe this thing, it will change how we show up in life. That Christ in you, Christ in me, is the hope of glory. Do you really believe that Jesus is in you? Like, do you believe it? I know some of you are like, yeah, I believe it, but. Don't add the but. <laughs> But, you know, sometimes I just still feel guilty. I just feel like I'm not. I just feel like, no. Jesus did it. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Now we are resurrected people. And God's kingdom now lives in the inside of us. And this is so important. Let me go back to some little bit of the proofs. Because if the early church, the early believers didn't believe it, all the apostles died as martyrs. All of them. Even John will run to the island of Patmos and survived for a certain time. All of them went, why would you be killed for something that is not true? Why would you have to die for something that is false? But all of them were willing to lay their head down because they believed and they knew that Jesus truly resurrected. The early church exploded in growth, even amidst the intense persecution because they knew and they believed that Jesus truly resurrected. But to me, above all, the testimonies of transformed lives that are happening every day around the world. That Jesus is still alive in the power of the Holy Spirit. Changing people, people's lives. Taking sinners and making them saints. Taking broken and messed up people like me and calling them to ministry. That Jesus is still active in the world today. It's only because of the resurrection. That even today, lives are still being changed. Even today, lives are still being transformed. And it means there is no sinner that is so far from God. It means I loved one in your family that you have been praying for. You can't afford to give, give up because Jesus is still actively at work today to change lives. If God could change me, a few of you have heard some of my stories. If God could transform my life, I don't see any sin that God will not change. God is still actively at work because of the resurrection power of Jesus. That is enough proof of the resurrection. And you all are seated here today. I know it's not just because your parents came to this church. It's not just because your mama went to church. It's because you believe. You've seen God at work in your life somewhere, sometime. That is proof of the resurrection. So this thing that we believe, it's not just because we are part of a group. It's because we know and we know without the shadow of that, that Jesus truly resurrected. So this Jesus that we serve, he's not a martyr to be pitied. He is the king of glory. He is the one that even the grave could not hold captive. He is truly the resurrection and the life. He's the one that is actively in the world today, everywhere around the world, encountering people, changing lives, transforming lives, delivering people. He's the one that is still in the world, healing the sick, setting the captives, opening blind eyes, doing incredible miracles all around the world. 
Even in nations that are the closest, Iran is one, has one of the, the fastest growing churches in the world. But Iran is one of the most persecuted nations because Jesus, the resurrection power of Jesus, is active and transforming everywhere, anywhere, without limits. There is no barrier that you can put to stop Jesus from working. There is no restriction that the government can put to stop Jesus from working. Because if death could not hold him captive, what else can stop him from doing what he does? Let's bow our heads and pray. This morning, if you are saying, I believed in this Jesus all this while, but somehow for some reason, my faith has been shaken. Maybe for something that happened and you're saying, God, I want you to just restore my commitment and my faith in you. I want you to quicken my heart again. I want you to just take a moment and talk to Jesus. If you are sin, I'm not even sure if I even truly believe like this. This is a moment just like, like Thomas. He said, Jesus, show me the proof. And Jesus showed him his hands. You can say, Jesus, now I believe. Now I think I see enough proof. Come be my Lord and my Savior. Or oh, there is something in your life that you feel like this is so dead. If there is no miracle, it can't come back alive again. This Jesus who rose from the dead is able to bring back every dead situation back to life. So would you present that to him this morning? Lord Jesus, here we are, your sons and daughters. I pray for anyone, God, who for some reason, maybe have believed the lies of the enemy about who they are as a child of God. And their faith has grown way. And I ask that you will quicken their spirit again. Let there be a revival in their hearts even now in the name of Jesus. Restore broken relationships with you, Father. For those who haven't truly ever encountered you and truly come to know this experience, this salvation and transformation that we talk about, that this morning... Let it mark a new beginning. And I pray for anyone who is going through something in life, who is dealing with something that feels hopeless. Breathe your life. Let your resurrection power, God, even now be activated and released into that circumstance. Let life come again. Whether it's in health or businesses or jobs, God, will speak life into those circumstances in the name of Jesus. Into relationships that are dead and broken will speak your life. And we thank you that you are our resurrection. And that you are our life. And that we can trust you in every situation. In Jesus' name, amen.